say to you, God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Well, praise God, we were supposed to go to Ohio last week, and we learned a real good lesson. When it's winter time, if you're going to do a documentary, go south. All right? That's what ultimately we ended up doing. The weather just cut us out and had the pleasure of meeting um, um, some wonderful people at the... Hebner area, and we got part of a documentary, if not a full, you'll see it later on in the next, uh, uh, this coming month, and I, I think you'll enjoy it, and hopefully next month we'll get to go to Ohio. Been doing some research on that, and it's going to be fascinating. We come to a new book tonight, we're going to do the book of Samuel, we've never taught Samuel on television before, and it's time we did. Samuel in the Hebrew tongue means asked of God or God heard, you could even say. And as always, we see types in the Word of God. And certainly in this one Samuel, we see the, the last of a theocracy. That is to say, a nation controlled by the Levitical priesthood and via God himself to a monarchy. It seems that man always wants a king. They were a little hurry because the type that you're going to see here in as much as Samuel will be the last judge before a king is anointed. You see the last real um, government run by a judge, which is to say Samuel, before a king takes over. So therefore naturally within Samuel's life we see a a type, if you would, of the Savior, of the time again when we would go back to that type of government where we would have a king in need, and that king would be Jesus Christ. In other words, what I'm saying, man cannot produce a king that is perfect, that can rule man. Therefore, with that thought in mind, the end of the theocracy, the beginning of the monarchy, the book of Samuel, Let's get right into it, and it's, it's really a very simple book. It's basically self-explanatory, but we'll cover those points, drawing them to your attention. Chapter 1, verse 1, let's go with it. Now, there was a certain man of Ramathian Zophim. That's an interesting word, and it means the two heights of the watchers. Letting you know as a watchman, right... I mean, in the first sentence, we see the two heights of the watchers, those that should watch, pointed out, of Mount Ephraim, Ephraim in the Hebrew tongue meaning double portion, and his name was el Kea, Kena, that is to say, required of Yah, required by God. Now, take these full translations rather than the transliteration, because it kind of sets the scene. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham. Jeroham meaning cherished. The son of Elihu, which is to say, whose God is he? The son of Tohu, and you'll remember Tohu Varuhu from Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. In this particular sense, as Jews, it means lowly. Lowly or waste. Uh, the son of Zaf. Zaf, of course, means uh, um, honeycombed. And Ephrathite. What is Ephrathite? Interesting because it's an inhabitant of Bethlehem, Judah. That is to say, the very place where Christ would be born of Mary. So the reason I take that time and that moment is to let you see the stage set. In other words, keying your mind to make this scripture come alive before your very face. And we ask that it does in the name of Yeshua Messiah Jesus uh, as we study this book. Verse 2. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah. Hannah means grace. It's important that you remember that. And the name of the other was Penina. Penina and Penina had children, but Hannah 
had no children. Penina, of course, means uh, pearl, and uh, we see a beautiful name there within this pearl, but we see one that is barren. We should think of the 7,000 in the end times, those that were ordered to remain barren in the spiritual sense, all right? Keep the, let, let, the, let the word flow, but keep those thoughts in mind. Verse 3, And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Now, what does Shiloh mean in the Hebrew tongue? Rest. Looking forward to that time even when Christ will be our rest, for there is no other rest. And the two sons of Eli, Eli being ascension, Hophni and Pinehas, uh, the priest of the Lord, were there. Uh, Hophni means uh, to fight, if you would, trouble someone. And, and uh, Pinehas means... Uh, uh, brazen mouth, or it's what a lot of people today in CB language, I think they call them ratchet jaws, right? A loud mouth, verse 4. And for priest's sons, you got it, I, Eli had some dandies, all right, as you'll discover, verse 4. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all his sons and her daughters portions. Five, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, being properly translated a double portion. For he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. It's important that you don't read over that now. Who shut Hannah's womb? Was it some birth defect or something of this nature? No. The Lord shut up her womb. Why? To give you a type of the barren one, the one most loved. Whereby you know and understand that great scripture in Isaiah plus those words of Christ as he walked up to Golgotha with that cross. Weep not for me, dear daughters of Jerusalem, for the day shall come when it shall be said, Blessed are the barren. In other words, blessed are those that do not take part in the first marriage, which is to say the marriage of Antichrist, uh, those that sap their lamps of oil. The Lord shut up her womb. The Lord doesn't have time to waste. Everything he does has a purpose. So let it be recorded in your mind. He wants the point made. He has closed her womb to teach you a lesson. Six. And her adversary also provoked her sore. You know, the chief adversary is Satan. That is his name. But many times when people do not understand, they become our adversary when you make the stand. Uh, for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. Again, the hand of God accomplished it. But it was taken by the other wife and no doubt children and no doubt neighbors as a weakness in the woman but God's will was done many times when you serve God you find the same affliction by the same adversary as he provokes you when the opportunity prevails seven a little footnote don't give him the opportunity verse seven and as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. It upset, it upset uh, Hannah. Verse 8, Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? And here you see his love and his respect for her. Though she provided him no children, he loved her indeed very, very much. She was special. Verse 9. So Hannah rose up uh, after they had eaten in Shiloh. Now where are they? Again, they're at Shiloh, what, which is what? Rest, which means what? Sabbath, which means what? Christ the rest, the Sabbath of this day. And after they had drunk, now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple 
of the Lord. So she went what? She went directly to him. She went directly to that place of rest whereby when you have a problem today, always remember, ultimately, that place of rest is where you must go. Christ, 11. And she vowed a vow. This is a very serious thing. And said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaiden, she made a very solemn vow, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and thou shalt no razor come upon his head. Do you know what kind of vow that is, dear one? Make a note of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 5. It's the vow of a Nazarite, and it was Christ. That Jesus of Nazareth, a place where only the low would, were no one to come from, that he would grow up into manhood. And this sign given, and the vow made by the woman, that he would, that she committed the vow of the Nazarite upon him. Again, God trying to get your attention, pointing toward Messiah. Twelve. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. He looked at her, and her mouth was moving, but what? Verse 13. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart. She wasn't speaking out loud. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought... She had been drunken. Now, that's the way many times Eli, being a great judge and, and a good man, even he was taken by this. Misjudged her. Make a, make a note of that as well. Man many times misjudges. God doesn't. Even though Eli is a good man, let me say. It was his sons that were bad. 14. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Verse 15, And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. And she had indeed. As, understand what she has done. As much as she wants a child for herself, she's already given it to the Lord if he gives the child giving something that you love very much to the service of God. Verse 16. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. 17. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Eli realizing, no doubt regretfully, that he had misjudged her when he sensed and could taste her spirit. Uh, 18. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace. Remember what we said Hannah meant in the Hebrew tongue? Her name meant grace. In thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Now what does that mean? She wasn't worried about it anymore. What did it mean? What do we call it today? Faith. She had faith to know that it was answered already. And she took on that countenance of one having prayer. Answered. 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord. And returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew him and his wife. When the Lord remembered her, she conceived. Verse 20, sharpen up for me. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. In other words, what is the lesson you should learn in that? Inasmuch as it was the Lord that ordered the, the, the womb to be barren, it was He as well that unlocked the womb. What is the in-depth meaning? Remain barren until your true husband returns. Until the true Lord 
sets foot on this earth to perform the wedding. I speak in a spiritual sense. Understand. Verse 21. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. That next time rolls around. 22. But Hannah went not up. And she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned. And then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. She knew she would have to give him up. So until he was weaned, it was her right. And it would be the only time that she would be able to hold that child to her bosom because of the vow. 23, And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Remember, he loved her very much. Tarry until thou hath, have uh, weaned him, only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. But that day did come, verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, back to that place of rest, and the child was young. The reason for the articles, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5 uh, and 6. Read them and you'll better understand. Verse 25, And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. 26, And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. In other words, making that vow. 27, you see how simple this flows when you take a moment to think on your father's word and plan. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. She had exercised that faith, and dear one, you must do the same. We're not playing church in this generation. Our Father is very real, and Christianity is not a religion. It is a reality. 28. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Meaning for an eternity he would serve the Lord. This Hannah, in a sense, is a prophetess. And think not that strange, for what of the judges prior to Samuel, and prior to even Eli, was that great woman whose name in the Hebrew uh, is, um, and I went blank. It's Deborah, yeah, Deborah. Uh, it was her name. She led Israel when there wasn't a man to lead. And Deborah went forth and led Israel as a judge. So think it not strange that God would touch this Hannah and she would become a prophetess. For this song or psalm that we're about to read is true to the letter. Listen to it carefully. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. Horn is always strength in the Hebrew. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. Who is the Savior? Yeshua. Jesus. Uh, he's the strength. He's the horn. See the prophecy within this. Verse 2. There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 32, the song of Moses. Their rock is not our rock. Our rock is Almighty God. Verse thir chapter three, verse three, rather in chapter two, talk no more of exceeding proudly. Let not arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. Do you understand that? God is a Lord of knowledge, and by Him, actions are weighed. Do you think He doesn't know? Do you think He doesn't understand? God is a, is a Lord of knowledge and he expects you to, to maintain that knowledge by what? 
studying the only true book of wisdom, and that is the Word of God. That knowledge, verse 4, the bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. You know, the bows of the enemy are broken in Ezekiel 38 and 39. God says, I shall knock his bow from his hand, 39.4, Ezekiel. But God is your strength. When you're weak, and when you're depressed, in this generation, remember where your strength is and gird yourself. What does that mean? Gird yourself with knowledge and truth. That's your belt. That's what you hold everything together with, is knowledge and truth. And then the strength uh, pours forth from the living God. Verse 5. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven. Do you understand that prophecy? You should. And she that hath many children is waxed feeble. In other words, she that had many people, the, Jer, Jer, Jeroboam in the Hebrew tongue means of many people, the larger part of the ten tribes. And the majority will be deceived in the end times, but God has set aside 7,000 that will not bow in knee. Romans chapter 11, and another book in this book of Kings. Samuel 1 and 2, if you were to pick up a Septuagint or a Vulgate, would be Kings 1 and 2. And the Kings 1 and 2 that you have in the King James would be 3 and 4. But these kings, as they set forth, these leaders, uh, most will follow into deception. But the barren woman shall produce seven. Seven meaning spiritual completeness. Those that will not um, wed until the true husband returns. This is one reason that Jesus stated concerning those that are barren. When he stated, what will it, when he was asked, what will it be like when I return to this earth? And he said, woe to those, one of the things, woe to those that are with child when I return. Because it's his bride, and if she's already suckling a small child, what does it mean? Naturally, she went where she was deceived. Why will the multitude wax feeble? Because of the deception. Because of the adversary. Verse 6. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. 7. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He's all knowing, beloved. He knows your heart and mind. He won't try to trick you. Trust him. Have the faith that Hannah had in him, that on his word from the priest, the judge, that is to say, she believed that, believed from his word the knowledge that he passes on. He can bring you low, or he can raise you up. Eight. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory, looking forward to that time. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon it, upon them, rather. Do you know how he did it? Do you know how the world was placed exactly where it is now and, and uh, causes it to remain here? That placed the sun where it is, can you answer me? Do you know how that he accomplished that? Well, of course you don't. No one knows. But this you should know. The same that accomplished that loves you. And he, that same hand that placed this universe in its present position in the perfect mathematical pattern of the entire thing loves you very much and he wants to take you in his hand and protect you and strengthen you. He can raise you up. He can put you down. Those that remain barren, that have faith, that know and understand. Don't someone take this literal now. Giving birth to children is a blessed thing and was the order given to Adam and Eve and the children go forth and replenish the earth. Uh, 
that we're speaking in a spiritual sense with the two husbands, the false husband and the true husband. God that accomplished these things concerning the universe loves you. He wants to protect you. Will you let him? He's anxious. He's ready. Will The question is, will you let him? You see, he won't come in where he's not invited. How's your old heart doing, friend? How's your old soul getting along? Do you live in an empty house, meaning your body? Or do you have him there? He wants in. Verse 9. He will keep the feet of his saints. Do you know what that? Do you think you have any worry? Saints are set aside ones, those that are barren, those that will set themselves aside. And the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. It doesn't matter if you're the strongest man in the world. That strength of your arm will not allow you to prevail. It is your love, your obeying the commands of our Father that are written that will cause you to prevail and triumph in the Son that was born that paid the price which this child in a sense is an example of don't you understand he that would bring in the 7,000 elect, the 144,000, and the untold millions upon millions that would believe and have even met their peace and reward uh, in part. 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. That's the outlook. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Do you want to know what the... Well, there's going to be an atomic holocaust in the end times. Uh-uh, friend, read it. He shall thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. And he shall give strength unto his king. You know, that's the topic of this. Theocracy to monarch, monarchy. A king. Only he brings the real king. And exalt the horn of his anointed. Who is his anointed one? And when you say the word anointed fully translated into the English, what is it? Messiah. The Anointed One. We're talking about Jesus here, in case you haven't caught up with the, the lecture, and I'm sure you have, for it, it flows so smoothly. As I stated, it takes very little comment from a teacher to not allow Samuel to flow smoothly in your mind, seeing the beauty and the prophecy and the in-depth truth that God brings forth in the example he sets forth in the barren. And she that was happy in producing in the flesh, again spiritually I'm speaking now. And we see the marvelous work of God and his plan in this psalm that this one hand, I mean in grace, and by grace uh, are you saved. As she brings forth this word, the promise of the Messiah. How beautiful it is. Our Father's Word, for it is a word of knowledge. Receive it as it comes to life before your very eyes. Verse 11, back to the moment, out of that beautiful psalm. And Elkanah went to Ramah, to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli, the priest. Now back to reality, my friends. Back to the church age, 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Here this high one, this priest, this judge, his sons were worthless. They didn't even know God. Verse 13. And the priest's custom with the people was, and though they're worthless, they don't know the Lord, but they're still the priest of the people, all right? Passing themselves off as preachers, you got it? Does that make it a little more real to you? was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething, while it was boiling there in the pot, with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. Fourteen. And he stuck it into the pan, or kettle, or cauldron, or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. For what? 
for himself. For the church, no, for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. You know what? They were breaking the law. All that the priests are supposed to have is the right shoulder. And, and another part escapes me at the moment. And they're raking them off, but good. And keeping it for themselves, not for the house of God. They're ripping the people off. You got it? There's nothing new under the sun. 15. Also, before they burnt the fat, remember the scripture, all the fat belongeth to the Lord. That's what makes you sick, is eating the fat. That's why the fat belongs to the Lord. Burn it, he says. The priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. Okay? Boy, and you talk about ripping them off. Eli's got some dandies here. They're absolutely worthless. They don't only take the hide. They take a little muscle along with it from the people. 16. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now and if not I will take it by force what kind of a church is this friend that's what you got right there good old Eli's boys I mean two whippersnappers there that that, that were uh, skin artists from the very beginning by that I mean rip off artists they knew how to skin the people and fleece them right real good and they did a good job of it we'll see what happens to them which will you be, the lad that's willing to serve, that sets the stage for the Messiah, a child of the barren one, you understand? Or will you be one of these that likes to play church? The choice is yours. Your father loves you. He wants you. It's up to you whether you allow him in. For that is one thing that you have total power over. I thank him for this word. We'll pick it up here in the next lecture. God bless you. Listen a moment, won't you please?